Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is George Werthner. He's a former Ecological Projects Director for the Foundation for Deep Ecology. Currently, he's Executive Director of Public Lands Media. He's an ecologist and wildlands activist. He's published 38 books on environmental issues in natural history, including such environmentally focused books as Well for Ranching, Wildfire, Through a Craft, Energy, and most recently, Protecting the Wild. So, as always, George, first, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Yeah, thank you, Derek. I always appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Oh, I, I love talking with you, too. So, except um, that normally I don't really like what we talk about. Um, <laughs> and well, to, to, today um, is one of those things that I don't I don't want to talk about, but we have to, which is... Can you talk about the Medicine Bow National Forest uh, is proposing a landscape vegetation analysis project? Can you talk about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so let me just start out with telling everybody where the Medicine Bow National Forest is, because a lot of people don't know where it is. Uh, but it's on the uh, Colorado-Wyoming border. Um, it, it is in Wyoming, but it, uh, near Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, where the University of Wyoming is, and um, the the Medicine Bow um, Forest um, highest points go up to almost 13,000 feet, and uh, and there are um, a number of small wilderness areas on the forest, uh, but a lot of the forest has been um, left unprotected. Although there are a considerable number of roadless areas, which this Medicine Bow Landscape Vegetation Analysis Project uh, will negatively impact. Um, what the for- Let me just sort of go over exactly what the Forest Service is proposing. This is, this is a huge project. It's going to affect potentially, uh, in one way or another, up to 360,000 acres. Now, just to put that in perspective, that's bigger than Grand Teton National Park. So it's a, it's a huge area that they're talking about. Um, and in their uh, modified final uh, alternative, uh, they talk about clear cutting up to 95,000 acres, um, doing what they call uneven aged uh, logging on 165,000 acres and 100,000 acres of other, quote, vegetation treatments, which can also include cutting trees, by the way. Uh, as well as things like prescribed burning, uh, removing what they call conifer encroachment, et cetera. In other words, one way or another, except for the prescribed burning, they're going to be cutting trees. Uh, and then, uh, to me, one of the other big um, sort of flashing neon signs here is that they want to construct up to 600 miles of temporary roads. And uh, if I don't mention it, Uh, A little bit later, please ask me about it, because temporary roads in many ways are just as bad as permanent roads uh, and in some ways worse. But they use the term temporary road to sort of diffuse, you might say, the opposition that might occur to have 600 miles of roads. Um, So anyway, this is a huge, huge project. Uh, The the only thing that I know of that's anywhere similar was back in the 19... um, 70s, the Targhee National Forest um, proposed a a, a massive timber sale on the border of Yellowstone Park. And um, and, and you can still see the effects of that logging from uh, photographs from space because there's a straight line on the border of Yellowstone where the trees still are intact and, and then where the trees were removed. And, you know, a lot of it was the same justification. Here, they're Part of the reason they want to do the logging is to uh, potentially, and and I can talk about this, why this isn't a good thing, it won't work, potentially reduce um, pine beetle uh, outbreaks in the future. Uh, Also to remove uh, trees with the idea that they will reduce large wildfires. And this is all being done in the name of, quote, uh, forest restoration. And, and to get the, um, the forest, as far as they're concerned, back to a healthy condition. And, you know, the, the whole thing of their proposal is that they have this industrial forestry uh, 
paradigm about what constitutes a healthy forest. And I, I just got to just quickly address that because a healthy forest, at least as they're defining it, is based on green trees. And um, from an ecosystem perspective, uh, a lot of plants and animals depend on dead trees. So the idea that you're improving the forest ecosystem and biodiversity by favoring green trees everywhere uh, demonstrates a lack of understanding of ecology. And, and and I see this prevalent all over the Forest Service these days. They're constantly talking about doing restoration for forest health, uh, but ignoring what constitutes a healthy forest ecosystem, of which uh, dead trees, both as snags and as on the ground when they die and fall over, and in streams are all very critical for uh, habitat for a lot, a lot of uh, wildlife species. Um, for example, I'll just use the example of trees and streams. Uh, there is no upper limit to the amount of dead wood in a stream in terms of how that works well for aquatic ecosystems. And so the more dead wood you have there, the better it is for fish, for insects, et cetera. And that translates not just for the fish, but for other wildlife species. For example, uh, one study in the River No Return Wilderness, where they can't log, um, demonstrated that after a fire, the uh, wood that was in the stream uh, provided habitat for uh, insects, uh, aquatic insects, which uh, then um, they, uh, most of them have, aquatic insects have a, uh, a, a portion of their life cycle where they're flying insects. Um, and those flying insects, provided more food for bats and birds. So you had greater number of species and, and population of bats and birds above streams that had burnt at high severity and had a lot of wood in them. So that's the kind of relationship that's ignored uh, by the Forest Service, particularly in this case. Uh, and I just want to, um, if you, if I may, I have the uh, their sort of um, environmental impact statement here and some of the things that they acknowledge in it and just sort of take them uh, one by one. Uh, when they talk, uh, they have a section here, you know, fuels and and uh, 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 fire, and they say treatments would manage hazardous fuel, improve egress and aggress, and provide protection to municipal uh, structures and communities in the wildlands urban interface. And, well, first of all, right there, um, most studies show that you don't have to treat anything more than about 100 feet from a building to uh, confer protection to those buildings if they can be protected at all. You know, a lot has to do with how the structure it itself is um, constructed and what's there and what's not there. But you don't have to clear cut 95,000 acres to protect buildings. Um, it says under timber, it says vegetation treatments would provide resilience to future e e epidemics uh, talking primarily about bark beetles as if that's a bad thing see that's the thing that's the uh mor mortality from bark beetles some some ecologists say bark beetles are like keystone species because so many other species depend on the bark beetle and and the habitat they create by killing trees um and that so the fact that they see uh bark beetle outbreaks as a negative demonstrates, again, this lack of ecological understanding. Um, and then, uh, you know, it goes on and says wildlife, uh, higher rates of regeneration of beetle-killed lodgepole stands will improve wildlife habitat more quickly. It's like, well, hold it. Well, well why is there a race? And, wh and how does that improve wildlife habitat more quickly? For example, just to give you one, um, elk, which are abundant on the Medicine Bow National Forest, uh, tend to favor places with a lot of down snags to hide out from hunters. Uh, so, you know, if you're an elk trying to hide from hunters, you, you don't want to see all the dead trees cleared out because that makes it easier for hunters to find you. Um, and um, they do mention uh, that less coarse woody debris, that dead wood, and snags um, will reduce habitat quality for many wildlife species. So they admit that, uh, but they uh, they think that the idea of, of of logging the forest is overall going to be good for wildlife. And again, you have to say, what wildlife are you talking about? Um, and in general, what is more uh, in, in, uh, not available? 
And in general, there's far more green forests around the West than there are forests with dead wood in them. So um, for those species that depend on the dead trees and wood, uh, it's a limiting resource. Then they talk about aquatic species, and they say there'll be an impact to rainbow and brown trout and uh, Colorado cutthroat trout, wood frog, leopard frog, boreal frog. But it says it probably won't cause them to trend towards federal listing under the Endangered Species Act, as if that's the only thing you have to worry about. Oh, God, we don't want to uh, get another listed species here. But it's okay if their numbers go down a lot. Uh, that, that's not a problem. And the same thing with uh, rare plants. They say, well, they'll be affected directly and indirectly by soil disturbance, forest canopy removal, and spread of invasive species, which is a big problem with all the roads and disturbance. But again, they say it's not likely to cause them to be listed under endangered species. So it's uh, it's one of those things that um, is again it's sort of like is that your 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 yardstick is not having it listed species, um, and then they have nauseous weeds and they say ground disturbance will increase invasive weed species. And that's a really big problem. In fact, some ecologists think that's one of the biggest long-term problems because once they get established in a forested area, they're very difficult to remove. And they can have a negative impact on so many species having uh, invasive uh, exotic species. And, of course, your best way to prevent invasives, most invasives are favored by disturbance. And when you're talking about 95,000 acres of clear cuts and 110,000 acres of other logging and 600 miles of road, you're 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 putting in a major disturbance. And um, and then you know it goes on to say about watersheds will be impacted. They say soils will be impacted. I'm not going to continue to read all these. Um, and the one positive thing they say for all the roads that they're going to make, they're going to say, well, there will be positive driving experiences because they will repair roads and put in proper signage. And I, I could just see somebody saying, God, I can't wait to drive some of those roads through all those clear cuts. That would be so wonderful. Uh, you know, it's just sort of, a, again, trying to uh, make something sound good that for most people would decide that it's not something that they they really want to do. Uh, and uh, they also, just again to show their bias, say that the scenic quality would increase in the long term as dead and dying conifers are replaced with live green trees. See, they're, they're using their definition of the bias of live green trees. And why is that a bias? And it, it is because green trees is what the timber industry wants. Uh, dead trees in a very few years become, uh, how shall I say, uh, less desirable as lumber. So what they're trying to do is favor uh, green forests because that's what the timber industry like, likes. And this is a whole result of how you're trained in forestry schools. You know, most foresters go through a forestry school. And what you learn in forestry school is how to be a technician. You're not really learning about ecosystems or how to think ecologically. You learn about things like how to build a road, how to scale timber, how to uh, favor certain tree species over others that are good for wood production. Um, you learn how to, you know, administer timber sales, et cetera. That's what you learn in forestry school. And, and not that those aren't skills that are useful if your goal is to extract timber. The problem is there's, you don't learn very much about what the extraction of timber does to the forest ecosystem in those programs. And so you have people that are, running these national forests and and, uh, and in places of decision-making that, for the most part, um, don't even ask the right questions, much less uh, have the answers that are necessary to evaluate how all these impacts can affect the forest ecosystem. So thank you for all that. And um, so I, I, a few things. One of them is that yeah. uh, just for scale, um, those numbers are really large, but let's let's put this in terms of 640 acres in a square mile, 6,400 square, mm -hmm. ma square 6,400 acres in 10 square miles, 64,000 in 100 square miles. So this is 150 square miles of clear cuts and a total of... I don't know, between five, about 500, about 500 square miles. Uh, 
which is 10 by 50 or 25 by 20. The, the point is just, it's, I mean, it's one thing to say 320,000 acres. For me, at least, it helps to picture it, that that is a huge, huge area. Well, here, here's a way I always put it for people to help them understand. A football field is about the same as an acre. So 360,000 football fields. I think most people can sit, imagine sitting in the stands of a, on a bench and looking down in the football field and imagine 360,000 of them. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so the, the next thing is what is this? And it, I am all in favor of second growth forest being allowed to grow back into, into what it's eventually going to be, what it eventually wants to be. But what of this 90,000 and 300 and some thousand acres, how much of that is, is ancient forest? How much is, is native forest? How much of it is, has already been logged once? How much of it's been logged twice? Do you know those numbers? Uh, I don't know what's been logged before. It's primarily, this forest is primarily uh, very limited in species and mostly lodgepole pine that they're talking about. Some aspen uh, on some slopes, well, in fact, a lot of aspen in some places. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll have some Engelman spruce and a few other things and, and you know, and maybe white bark pine up high. But it's it's primarily a forest of, of lodgepole pine. And, um, uh, you know, lodgepole pine in this region, the Rocky Mountain region, that is, uh, tends to uh, be episodically affected by bark beetles and by um, wildfire and uh, regenerates after those events. And with lodgepole pine uh, and, and bark beetles, t there tends to be mortality seldom goes over 50%. So you have a lot of trees left on the, on the uh, slope if bark beetles have come through that are released from competition and grow very quickly then. Uh, I've seen, uh, I was on a field trip one time um, in Jackson Hole, and uh, the leader of it had previously uh, cored some trees. And one of the trees he cored uh, had, uh, was 40 years old, and a, a tree that was identical size to it um, was 150 years old. Uh, and the one that was only 40 years old had been released after a bark beetle outbreak. And so it grew very rapidly. It was surprising to me how quickly it got large. Um, and um, uh, But, you know, the other ones that are growing under dense stands, like the most uh, lodgepole pine forests come back very dense, um, tend to have denser wood. And why that's important, you know, foresters don't like this. They like the fast-growing trees. Um, but dense wood uh, is uh, well, in terms of lumber, they love old growth forests for lumber because it has dense wood. But it also, the reason is, is it, 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 um, it resists, uh, rotting in the natural world when it's denser like that. So if you have a large tree that's grown slowly it, and it, you know, eventually dies and falls down, it will last on the forest floor or in a stream or wherever it lands far longer than quick growing trees. So one of the problems with this whole thing of trying to get trees to grow quickly so they can, you know, theoretically be logged again uh, is that it, um, it creates a forest uh, with trees that are less valuable, ecologically speaking, in many ways. The other problem with what they're doing here is that, um, and, and, and this is something that's sort of a new insight and that is that uh, as i mentioned like in bark beetles um, approximately half of the trees might get attacked and the other half don't and there are exceptions to that but in general across the landscape that's what you would find and that um uh percentage is partly because there's differential resistance to bark beetles in different individual trees uh, genetic, uh, gen genetically um, motivated differences. So, for example, some lodgepole pine um, are able to extract more water from the soil, which means they have uh, more sap, and their sap is what they use as a defense against bark beetles. They try to uh, expel the, the beetles with their sap uh, and push them out of the tree before the eggs and, and larvae can attack them. Um, 
and, and there's no way that you can tell which trees have that. And so going in and clear cutting 95,000 acres, for example, you, you, or even doing the uh, intermediate uh, logging they're talking about, um, you may be eliminating a lot of the trees that would give future resistance to bark beetles from that population. And, and there's also all sorts of genetic differences, resistance to fire, resistance to drought, resistance to cold weather. I mean, whatever it might be. Um, and so whatever environmental um, uh, issues that arise for the forest, whether it's drought, whether it might be um, more snow, whatever, uh, it, uh, we can't predict what those influences will be and which trees are the ones that are going to have the right genetic mix to resist them. And so in a way, you know, they're talking about uh, improving the forest health and in the way that they're doing things, they are reducing the forest health because they can't tell which trees have these uh, genetic attributes. And and furthermore, we can't predict which ones will be necessary in the future either. We, we know climate change is happening, but exactly how a tree will adapt or uh, be able to uh, ad adopt the right kind of um, uh, attributes to uh, fa favor them in those situations, we, we just don't know what they will be. So that's one of the problems that we have here in the, in the way that they're approaching this. The other thing I, I think I should mention again, we've talked about it before, but the other justification for this is to, quote, reduce um, large fires. And there was just a ton of information out there, two things. One, it shows that forests that have been attacked by bark beetles, despite the fact that you have more dead material, they actually burn less uh, than green forests. Green forests under extreme fire weather conditions, and that's always the qualifier you have to put out there, but it's a very important one. Extreme fire weather conditions usually include excessive drought, <clears throat> along with wind, low humidity, et cetera. But the, um, the, the thing is, is under drought, green trees in particular, their needles and branches um, become very flammable, uh, and they uh, have resin in them so that they are more likely to burn. And what burns in a fire is the fine fuel. So like the needles and the uh, uh, cones, the small branches, not the main bowl of the tree. And that's why after a fire, you have lots of snags. So they trying to suggest that by going in and logging dead lodgepole pine or even green lodgepole pine, because you will um, reduce fires in the future by reducing, quote, the fuel load, ignores the research that suggests that the fuel loading from bark beetles is less of a problem and, and uh, has less of an influence on, on large fires than the weather and the climate. And the other part of that is, um, you know, because of those weather criteria, uh, you can't really stop a large fire, especially when there's a, a high wind blowing the fire. You don't put firefighters in front of a fire like that. So you're, you're trying to work from the sides at best if you can. Uh, and that high wind will push fire embers far ahead of any fire line, any, you know, even clear cuts, et cetera, are not gonna stop a fire under extreme fire weather conditions. And why is extreme fire weather conditions criteria qualifier important? Because most fires, don't grow very big. They, if you don't have the right conditions for a fire, you will not get a large fire. It doesn't matter how much fuel you have. I mean, go to the coast forest of Oregon or Washington, and there's more biomass there than any place in, in the Medicine Bow Forest or any place else in the rest of the West. So if biomass alone were the factor that led to large fires, you would expect the largest fires on the coast of Oregon and Washington. Well, we don't have them there. Why? Because it's cool and it's moist. And um, and so the point being is that most fires go out. They're small. Uh, you know, you logging might reduce those fires to some degree, but they're not the fires that are cons of concern even to the public in general. Um, the the larger fires that burn 10,000 acres or 50,000 acres are all climate and weather driven events. And the overwhelming evidence is, is under those circumstances any kind of logging intervention doesn't work and 
in many cases will enhance the fire spread. And how does that happen? Well, the reason is, again, if you consider what are the factors that drive large wildfires, which includes um, low humidity, which includes drying of fuels, which includes wind, when you log the forest, when you put in logging roads, um, all of those things help to dry out the forest stands and the fuels there. And they also permit wind penetration. So the very things that drive large wildfires are enhanced through logging and actually can increase uh, the likelihood of a, of a fire spread. And I also have to mention, you know, they were talking about 600 miles of temporary roads. Um, Roads are the main source of ignition for most wildfires. You know, lightning is an important thing, but more ignitions are human caused. And how do they uh, are they caused? Well, from people camping or driving or whatever on uh, forest roads. So the more forest roads you have, the more chance you are enhancing the chance of a fire. And so this whole idea that we're going to log the forest to reduce fires is also misleading. And now I'd like to talk about the temporary roads for a second. 600 miles of temporary roads. Temporary is meant to make you think it's not so bad. But here's the problem. One, a temporary road still provides access. It still dries out the forest. It's still a vector for spread of weeds. It actually provides access um, to uh, hunters, to trappers, to uh, any anybody else who might uh, ORV users, et cetera, will get into the forest through those roads. And the idea that it's temporary uh, is usually create, the temporary is created by putting up a sign, sometimes a, go, sometimes a gate. None of those things really effectively preclude human use. Um, even if people don't drive it, it's still easier to walk. The other thing with temporary roads is they usually don't restore they say they restore them, but they don't usually restore them to their pre-road construction uh, appearance and and uh, uh, situation. So the uh, road lens, um, which is you know the horizontal and cut off sharps on the uphill side, uh, is a, uh, allows a lot of water to get onto the road surface, which is also compacted. The soil has been compacted by the logging equipment so that it, it, it is much more prone to erosion than what existed before the temporary road was there. Um, and a further problem with temporary roads is that uh, a lot of them are built to lower standards than the permanent roads. So uh, they're actually more prone to erosion, more prone to having uh, uh, culverts wash out, uh, et cetera. And so they don't really restore them to the pre-logging condition or pre-road construction <clears throat> condition, and they provide all these negatives. So when you're talking about 600 miles of roads, um, on, in addition to whatever exists on the forest already, I don't know what's already there. I'm sure it's thousands of miles already on the Medicine Bow. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, really increasing access and the problems for um, uh, you know, in terms of, to, for example, elk security habitat or, or anything like that by eliminating that uh, uh, security and increasing the access. So I just want to throw in a, a factlet about logging roads and sediment that I have in front of me. Uh, logging roads produce between 20 and 35 tons of sediment per acre of road surface per year. One acre is about 0.6 miles. So that's about a ton per year, every hundred feet of logging road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, here's here's the thing. You can ask yourself. Um, you know, there is sedimentation that results after a, a wildfire if it's a high severity fire. But what you find is the vegetation grows back very quickly, and you don't have those road cuts, and you don't have that soil compaction which funnels water. Um, as a road does. And so within a few years, uh, the sedimentation rate usually goes back to pre-fire levels. Whereas with the road, you just have chronic sedimentation for as long as that road exists. And um, a lot of times with these temporary roads, by the way, they bank them, as they call it. They, they, uh, they never um, totally eliminate them because they want to use them again someday. Uh, and so they're always there eroding 
And that's one of the reasons why places like the Pacific Northwest, where salmon and steelhead and, and so forth have declined so radically, a lot of that decline is due to sedimentation in the spawning habitat and the streams. And, uh, you know, these same areas had fires historically, uh, not very frequently, as I mentioned, especially in the coast, but even in other inland locations, um, the, the logging routes have created a, a sedimentation load that did not exist historically and um, increases uh, the uh, likelihood that uh, uh, spawning habitat will be covered with sediment. And um, unlike a natural fire situation, you might have some of that, uh, that spawning habitat actually gets scoured immediately after fire, improving it, and then you don't get the continued sedimentation covering it. And um, so uh, that is one reason why salmon and steel have declined in the face of logging. So I, I want to go back to the forests themselves in a minute, but it, it just occurred to me that there might be people listening to this who live in an urban area and might not know why sedimentation is bad for a stream. Can you Can you give a a one minute primer on what sedimentation, why sedimentation is harmful to aquatic life? Well, there are a couple of ways. One, um, a lot of fish overwinter in deep holes. And if you get a lot of sedimentation, you'll fill in those holes so their overwintering habitat is reduced. Uh, it also smothers the aquatic insect habitat. You know, a lot of insects live in the gravels in the uh, stream bottom. And uh, they also, you know, they have gills just like fish. And uh, they have to be able to breathe, uh, you know, get the oxygen from the water. If there's too much sediment, then they can't uh, effectively breathe. So if you have less, uh, if you have more sediment, you have less aquatic uh, insects and so forth. So that means you have less food for the fish. And the fish have the same problem, too. Uh, you know, they can, they can live in sediment uh, uh, water to a degree, but they can't necessarily, uh, you know, at least the fish that are native to the, the West, most of the fish, um, require clean water for their uh, um, spawning habitat. And then the other problem, too, is that um, you, you, when you get this huge dump of sediment, you know, you can, you can get something like that that might wipe out it. Uh, you know, let's say it happens after the fish have spawned. Let's, let's use uh, rainbow trout or steelhead on the coast. You know, most of them spawn in the spring. Um, so you, let's say you have a winter storm that comes in and, uh, in April or something like that and dumps a bunch of sediment in it. Well, you might lose that one year's recruitment. Uh, you might, uh, lose two years, but you're, you're not likely to lose recruitment for 10 years. And if you did, you'd have, you wouldn't have hardly any fish left. Uh, because a lot of these fish don't live more than, you know, six, seven, eight years. So, uh, they need to have an opportunity to spawn without that um, loss of spawning habitat. And the problem with roads, of course, is that the, uh, as I mentioned, the sedimentation is there constantly all the time. And then they're also much more prone to landslides because of the steep uh, hillside slope that results uh, <clears throat> after cutting across the slope with a road. So that uh, is more likely to give way under heavy rain and another thing too is when you cut across the slope like that there's on all these slopes there's subsurface water flow that you and i don't see and that subsurface flow then comes to the surface where the road cut is and then it gets right on the road and and, and then that of course flows down the road because the road's compacted soil instead of going into the soil like would happen naturally and uh so you get this higher level of flow which then helps to increase erosion of the road bed itself. Okay, thank you for that. I want to go back to, to the forest and to the notion of dead trees, in, in specifically a lodgepole pine forest. And what percentage of, if you were to go back in time to the Medicine Bow Range, to and you're going to go back 1,000 years or 500 years, or pre-logging is what I'm talking about, what percentage of standing dead trees, I'm sorry, what percentage of standing trees in that forest might have been dead? I mean, is it is it 20%, well, 50%, 5%, 90%? Uh, I can't say the answer to that because it would, it's an episodic thing. In other words, um, you would have 
a couple of hundred years in in the Rockies there where the lodgepole is on the Medicine Bow. The typical thing would be to go several hundred years, maybe as much as 500 years, without a major wildfire. And then, the, you know, all the weather and everything else lines up right. And then you have a major fire. So then you would have a fairly large percentage of the landscape that was, uh, you know, dead and a lot of snags. If uh, if we were to use Yellowstone as an example, the, the 1988 fires uh, in the Yellowstone uh, landscape of Yellowstone Park uh, affected, I, I want to say about a third of the park uh, burned. Uh, and, you know, so if you had been there in 1987, uh, you would have had a very small percentage of the park as snags because there hadn't been a major fire in the park in a couple of hundred years, 250 years, I think was the last major fire before that. So, uh, and then if you were there in 1990, well, then you'd say, you know, a third or whatever the percentage is uh, burned. And now you have that. So that those dead trees will last a long time on the landscape though. You know, they gradually fall over and so forth, but in the dry high environment of the medicine Bow national forest or Yellowstone or whatever, those dead trees uh, remain as snags for, for decades, and then they fall over, and then they remain as logs on the ground for many, many more decades. Um, and so they're contributing to that landscape uh, as snags and down wood for hundreds of years. And, and, and that's why these large fires are so important, because in a sense, those, those are sort of uh, the input of dead wood into the environment there's this background mortality that's going on all the time. You're going to have trees dying from insects or drought, individuals, you know, on small scale. But it's the occasional big episode of a wildfire, or in the case of bark beetles, same thing, that has a major impact of putting a lot of down wood and dead wood into the forest ecosystem. And and the other thing I might want to mention, too, because we, we need to talk about this all the time, is that uh, with climate change, you know, dead trees store carbon, and they last a long time, especially these higher forests that grow slowly. As I said, slow-growing trees take a long time to rot. So even if they burn in a forest fire, um, they uh, leave most of the carbon on the site as roots, as snags, as down wood that falls on the ground, as charcoal from after a fire. Uh, whereas if you go and log it, you remove a lot of the carbon. If you clear cut, you're taking most of the carbon away, um, and 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 it immediately is uh, released into the atmosphere through the, both the transportation and manufacture of that into wood um, uh, products. Uh, most of that um, carbon and uh, the original carbon in a forest, you're usually left with about between 16 and 20 percent as wood. And then, and then a lot of that uh, wood product, and a lot of that wood product is stuff that doesn't last very long. You know, it's pallets. It's uh, depending upon what it's used for, it might be made in the paper, and, and so forth. So the the long term storage is much less than you have by having those trees remain on the site. Now, a tree that is rotting is releasing carbon as well, but it's doing it slowly over many many decades and to, to centuries. And right now we have to reduce our carbon input as much as possible. And there's a lot, a lot of studies that show um, that we could um, make a big difference in the carbon budget of the United States and the world if we protected forests rather than um, uh, logging them and so forth. And, and the other thing to remember is that, um, again, these fires are episodic, so they – you know, if you had a major fire on the Medicine Bow or major fire like happened in Yellowstone, the likelihood, the probability that you will have a similar large forest any fire any time in the near future is pretty low. It could happen, but it's low. Um, and that's another thing about these uh, clear cutting and so forth. Remember I said it was fine fuels that burn well in a fire. So you clear cut the area, and what do you do? You stimulate the creation of a lot more fine fuel. You have more grass, you have more shrubs, you have small trees. Um, they actually are creating a landscape that is more likely to burn than a mature forest uh, in the same area. Now, that will eventually change into a mature forest. So if it survives through that period of time without a fire, 
uh, then, you know, it, it'll eventually grow up and be a mature forest, assuming they don't go in and log it again. And that's the other assumption that's behind this is they, they want to create uh, the forest so it can continue to be logged. And every time they do it, they reduce the carbon storage. So I'm going to, I'm going to use some very aggressive language here because it's, I, 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 this has made me angry for decades that I don't understand how anyone can be stupid enough to actually believe that you improve the health of a forest by cutting it down. I, I, I don't, I mean, the, I'm stammering now because it, I've been stammering about this for literally since 1992 or 93 um, because this is an excuse that's used a lot. And you're going to cut down the trees because you think at some point in the future they might get sick. And that that, I don't – I I understand that they make this as an excuse, but I don't understand how there is anyone in the entire world who is stupid enough to believe it. Well, there are a lot of people that believe it, unfortunately, and and you know, and, and well, it you're makes right. No, it you makes no sense. Read... It makes no sense. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's I call it the Vietnam treatment. You know, during the Vietnam War, I was I was a youngster then, so I, you know, I wasn't in Vietnam. But uh, you know, the problem, the the idea was we're going to carpet bomb Vietnam to save it, and that was the same sort of thing. We're going to just totally destroy the country to save it. For what? You know, who are you saving it for and what are you saving it from? Uh, it's the same sort of idea that is used to save the forest from these natural uh, processes that actually enhance and preserve the um, biodiversity of the landscape. You know, here's a statistic that's very interesting. The second highest biodiversity found in the West, in Western forests, is in forests that have burned at high severity. Uh, after old growth forests, that's the next highest level of biodiversity. When you look at what these forests look like after they get done logging and so forth, they have greatly reduced the amount of habitat diversity. They've changed the age structure. They've, they've taken away the down wood. They have sanitized the forest. And a lot of foresters like sanitized forests. I, I have been on you know, six or seven um, of forests that are designated as sustainable forestry on private, these are all private forest lands. And in every case, uh, there's hardly any down, sna- uh, down wood. There's almost no snags. You know, they may have a token snag one per acre or something like that. But in general, uh, they're not, in my view, uh, ecological, uh, they're, they're ecologically degraded forests and not sustainable at all in the long run. Uh, the, but the criteria that are being used by the foresters making the ratings is, well, did they clear cut it? Well, they might not have clear cut it, but it's still nevertheless is a degraded forest when you start taking out uh, all this wood, particularly the um, the larger trees that would be eventually uh, be the down wood and the snags. So, uh, you know, the other thing about all this I mentioned a little bit early is the probability that any of these areas will be hit with a major fire or bark beetle outbreak any time in the period of time that they are uh, likely to be effective. Uh, um, You know, even if you grant, and of course I can tell you why I don't believe they are effective, but even if you grant that, say, logging the forest would reduce large fires, um, that only lasts for a very short time, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years at most. And when you're dealing with, say, lodgepole pine in the Rockies that burns in uh, high severity episodic fires that happen hundreds of years apart, you have to say, well, you're doing all this manipulation of the of the landscape and causing lots of ecological harm now in anticipation that you might stop something that isn't going to happen for hundreds of years. Um, so, again, that's just sort of insanity. So we have about um, five minutes left, and um, you mentioned before the interview started that there are some organizations fighting this. So can you talk briefly yeah. about that and then also talk about – I mean, I think – I was going to say that this is outrageous, but, you know, frankly, 
this is just big outrageous because there's lots of small outrageous timber sales too. But so if somebody cares about forests and either they care about this particular forest or they care about stopping deforestation in general, what do you want people to do? But first talk about uh, the organizations fighting it. Okay. Uh, Wild Earth Guardians are based in New Mexico. Uh, they're one of the uh, objectors to the um, uh, to the logging. The Center for Biodiversity, also based in Arizona. Uh, you know, both of these groups have staff all over the West, but uh, they are objecting to it. And then the Sierra Club in Wyoming, the Sierra Club chapter in Wyoming, is also objecting to it. Um, and I think that um, they're all doing so for the right reasons. I'm so glad that they are uh, trying to uh, take this to court uh, and fight it. Um, and, and what I, you know, I will say too about this is that um, if they can, you know, I don't know how much of all this is influenced by the current administration. In other words, uh, I do know that the Trump administration has said basically ignore all environmental laws, you know, ramp up logging, et cetera. Uh, so if they can slow this down and maybe uh, halt it even temporarily for a couple of years, we might have a different administration that might be a little less aggressive about logging and a little more willing to consider all the science. What I see um, with the Forest Service in general, besides their sort of industrial forestry bias, is that th that bias also affects uh, the science that they use. And, you know, this is a topic I, I it'd be worth talking about, I don't know, the whole show, but, you know, how do you get this conflicting different science? You know, you can find scientists that'll say logging will reduce high severity fires. And then you'll have other scientists that say, no, it doesn't work. Uh, and, and, and what you have to do is be a very careful reader of the science. What, what I find a lot of times is there's a lot of nuance in how this research is done. It's not that the scientists that conclude logging might uh, reduce fires uh, are lying, but you'll read there and you'll see they might not say, when I say, well, this will work in most fires, but not in high severity fires, so the one or two percent fires that are driven by extreme fire weather. Um, well, that's an important thing, as I mentioned earlier, because extreme fire weather is when you get all the big fires. So, so you know, citing some reference that says, well, logging will reduce fires. Well, yeah, I agree with that, too, under conditions when fire isn't uh, an issue at all. And then second is what I would say, I don't necessarily want to stop the large fires either because they're ecologically important, uh, which is, of course, another assumption that's built into all this stuff where they're saying they want to stop the fires. And so you have to be able to look at the um, underlying assumptions and qualifiers that exist uh, to weigh through all the literature that, you know, often is conflicting. And, uh, and of course, the Forest Service tends to pick all the literature that, uh, you know, basically agrees with its program goals of increasing logging for the benefit of the timber industry. I mean, it's just you, you have to say to yourself, how come – you know, national forests, uh, I mean, national parks uh, don't seem to need the log to get rid of bark beetles and or, or to reduce fires. Um, you know, the, the majority of large fires are happening on national forest lands, and yet the places like wilderness areas, uh, national parks, et cetera, places with a lot of protection actually have fewer acres of high severity fire than the places that are managed. Well, you have to ask yourself, why is that? Well, for the reasons that I mentioned, if the logging actually a lot of times exacerbates the conditions for fire spread. I've mentioned this before, that, that the local um, national forest is much better managed than many of the national forests that I've ever lived around. And it didn't take long for me to realize that the reason is because they don't have a commercial timber sale program. And that ends up mm -hmm. affecting everything about it. So what happens is the biologists, instead of having to try to justify a timber sale, the biologists here can work on actually improving habitat, removing old mining roads, and, and doing what, what um, I think management should actually consist of. Uh, exactly. And, and you know, uh, you just made, made a mention that a lot of times these 
um, groups that are in collaborations will support logging because there'll be some part of the proposal that will say, like this proposal for the medicine bow, says they're going to get rid of 10 miles of permanent road. So you'll have, I'm not aware of any environmental groups that are supporting this, but in other parts of the West, you would have environmental groups supporting a logging program like this saying, well, they're going to remove 10 miles of permanent road, even though they're going to make 600 miles of new temporary roads. Uh, and, and so that's good. Aren't you for removing roads? Yeah, I am. But that's, that's, a, you don't, first of all, you don't have to log the forest to remove roads. You know, I mean, there's, they lose money on every timber sale in the West. If they spent that money removing roads, uh, they'd have, they'd have plenty of money available to do that. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of dishonesty even among some of the collaborative environmental groups when they support these uh, logging and thinning timber sales. So we're running out of time, but um, how – if somebody is 24 years old and they care about forests but they don't know what to do, or as I was when I was 29 and didn't know what to do until I met John Osborne, um, what do you how, – how, how does someone get started doing some sort of forest protection? Well, I think that the, the there are two ways to get started. One um, is you can you know if you if there's a you know local forest near you, uh, learn about it. In other words, you can get on a mailing list from the Forest Service or the BLM, whoever you know public agency is there, uh, to alert you about proposed timber sales. And then the next thing I do, I think there's nothing better than being on the ground familiar with the landscape. So go to those places that are proposed, see what it's like, see what's there. And then uh, the third thing is be a participant. That is uh, the, the agencies are still required to take public comments. They somewhat ignore them uh, in general, but the thing you have to remember too is that um, a lot of these people working for the Forest Service or whatever, you know, they got into forestry and or wildlife biology because they actually love the outdoors and the forest. Some of them have not been totally perverted by the forestry, uh, industrial forestry paradigm, and they rely on people uh, speaking up and, and arguing for protection of these lands so that they can go into meetings and they can go into their supervisors and say, you know, th this is maybe not a good idea, and and they need that sort of support, moral support, and uh, and then you can you know you can set up things for legal objections, and uh, to do that the way the rules are, you have to be somebody who who has written comments and and has participated along the way, and if you do all that, then you can maybe get somebody to uh, act on your behalf, like Wild Earth Guardians or Center for Biodiversity, or any of these other groups. Uh, lines for a while, Rockies and the others that are quite willing to uh, put in a lawsuit, um, but they still need to be able to do it on the behalf of individuals. So I think that's, you know, you don't have to be an expert on forestry or anything like that to be somebody who says, you know, I think I'm going to be negatively impacted here, and um, and I object to this timber sale or or whatever is being proposed. Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you, as always, for all of your great work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been George Worthner. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.